We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides. Hello and welcome to Liberty Nation Radio, heard coast to coast on the Radio America Network. I'm your host, Mark Angelides. On today's special show, we examine the upcoming Supreme Court session, what are the big cases to watch for for freedom lovers, and analyze the epic VP debate. Remember, this show is proudly sponsored by LibertyNation.com, where you can access podcasts, breaking news, analysis, and a range of biting and brilliant shows to whet your appetite for freedom and your fondness for the great American constitution. The first Monday of October, traditionally when the Supreme Court comes back, and this year is no different. The Supreme Court is back in session this week, and what they have coming in store for us, well, that's why we have with us Liberty Nation's legal affairs editor, Mr. Scott Casenza. Scott, thanks for being back on the show. Thank you, Mark. Always a pleasure. So I'm excited. The last uh, SCOTUS session, Supreme Court session, was fantastic in terms of really interesting constitutional decisions. Now, I know that that blew a lot of people's heads clean off, as it were, uh, legislatively speaking, uh, judicially speaking. But I think for those people who do enjoy interesting decisions out of the court, it was a great season finale. So what is the uh, what does the sequel have in store for us? <laughs> well, yeah, it's I mean, I'm a uh, a limited government advocate and fan mark and uh to have some wins in the limited government column and a court that seems tilted in that direction is a welcome change from uh so much of my life observing the court and seeing uh a majority of justices seem to favor the other direction. So uh as long as the hits are coming out uh, the right way, that that to me is what what makes for a, a good session. Um, I, I cannot be as detached from it as a, a pure academic might and say, "Well, these are fascinating issues, and uh, you know, interesting to to observe their examination." Well, the, the the thing that really most captivates me about the the last season, I'm referring to it like a TV show because that you know that's a uh... Uh-huh. This is this is my version of reality TV. It, it's my it's my Real Housewives of America, uh, SCOTUS edition. Um, but what really fascinated me was that the cases that are decided are ones that will have ramifications across the country and therefore the world. Literally this year, next year, going forward, these are things that have ramifications and undulations that <clears throat> you can see playing out in real time. It is. And uh, it's it's an amazing I, the way I think about that is it's an it's amazing how much influence Donald Trump's Supreme Court selections have had on the country and will continue to uh, going forward. It's quite so, remarkable. So as a limited government uh, fan, I guess uh, is the right word, the aficionado of all things limited government. What are the big cases that you're going to be keeping your eye on and reporting on, of course, for the pages of LibertyNation.com? Yes. Well, I can't say that uh, uh, I am going to report on all of them for the, for the pages of LN because we have a, a stable of great writers and uh, some others may handle some of them. But I picked out five cases that I think uh, are, are, are a bit interesting for us to talk about here. Scott Cassandra's Desert term. Island top five Supreme Court <laughs> cases. Well, C- coming in that. at number five. <laughs> For this term so far, because uh, we might remind everybody that cases are accepted on a rolling basis Mm. for the term upcoming. So the term that's about to start in October will go forward and will conclude uh, if history is our guide by July the 1st, 2025. And as cases present themselves um, for consideration, the Supreme Court people file what's called a petition for certiorari. That is the petition they file in the Supreme Court the Supreme Court to hear their issue. And uh, if the Supreme Court will say yes, then they'll get on uh, the schedule until about mid-spring, in which case, um, unless it's an urgent matter, they'll just push it over into the October 2025 uh, seating. So without further ado, <laughs> let's get into it. Well, there, right. there was plenty in of no ado partic- there, but very good information. Very <laughs> in no particular... In no particular order, no by particular the way. I'm order. Not giving okay. these. Uh, one, we have Food and Drug Administration v. Wages and Lion Investments, LLC. And uh, this concerns whether the Court of Appeals uh, erred in setting aside an FDA order denying a company's application to market 
flavored e-cigarettes as arbitrary and capricious. So can the FDA stop companies from marketing uh, flavored nicotine replacement products, e-cigarette vape type stuff? Um, when the uh, Trump presidency was first confronted by this, the FDA was going to uh, make it so that that e-cigarette stuff was going to be banned. They were just going to ban it because they said it's uh, being regulated like a drug. They're dispensing nicotine like a drug without FDA authorization. And the wild popularity of the e-cigarette uh, juice, if you call it that, um, basically made them dial it back. And Trump's sort of uh, skepticism, I think, about big government action maybe also uh, played a hand in that. So we'll see. Uh, right now it's legal for sale, but you can't do that, uh, the marketing like they want to. And, and, if, and how it's captioned again in by the people who wish to ban it is that any uh, discussion of flavorings or colors is an appeal towards children. Um, and of course, adults eat candy bars too. So, um, <laughs> you know. Absolutely. But, but children don't have disposable income of such a great level to uh, engage in a thousand candy bar a week habit, not like me, uh, like not, some other not people. To <laughs> not to mention that it's prohibited for sale. Uh, to children. So that that's another reason why uh, the government might make it legal for companies to advertise, you know, the sale of something. Um, okay. And the broader ramifications of that are, of course, that uh, it presumably the small government approach there is that it's, it's none of the government's business what types of flavor or a product that is legally available no, for sale. No, you're wrong, Mark. That's not an accurate statement of what okay. the interest is for the small government advocate. What the small government advocate's interest in interest is there is no specific grant of authority from Congress to the FDA to regulate this, which then you could apply consequences mm -hmm. and accountability to the legislators who would vote for such a thing or not. This is about delegation. And this is about whether or not when the FDA when they, they pass a broad, a broad grant of authority for the FDA to regulate uh, drugs, for instance, does that include this type of thing? Or should it be more specific? And for the limited government advocate, it is, hey, if, the, if you're going to tell people you can't do or, or say something, or maybe we'll put you in a cage, which is the end consequence, right, of disobeying a, a government ruling or order, then they should actually have that accountability and be forced to vote on it rather than just shuffling it off to the bureaucrat with some broad grant of authority that was given decades ago, even before the invention of e-cigarette technology or the vape. Uh, I might, obviously I'm not a lawyer, nor do I play one on television, but wouldn't this fall under the recent uh, Chevron deference in terms of a grant of authority, the recent decision on the Chevron deference? Uh not according to the administration. No, the, the, the deference is when there's an ambiguity involved, Okay, uh, whether or not uh, it will be kind of tossed to the uh, to the government and given their their agency deference or not. This is, uh, I think, less of the uh, the ambiguous uh, sort. OK, great. So what's up for next on your Desert Island top five? Next up is Free Speech Coalition v. Paxton. Okay. And this involves uh, spicy content, we might say, uh, on the Internet, uh, explicit content that Texas and, uh, and other states uh, have said adult content providers online need to get a like an ID or some uh, sort of robust age statement from the user rather than just clicking a button that says, you know, I'm over age, whatever, and it's OK for me to view this thing before they display content that they otherwise could could not or not otherwise could never display to a minor. Um, the appeals court applied what's called a rational basis review of the decision. This is out of the, uh, the conservative Texas judiciary, including the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. And the Free Speech Coalition says it, that strict scrutiny should be applied because even though it's sexually explicit material, it's still covered uh, under uh, the free speech protections of the First Amendment. And so access to uh, to the spicy content may be uh, uh, further restricted or um, unleashed, as it were, uh, depending on the ruling.
we're going to come back with the continuation of Scott Cassenza's Desert Island Top 5 Supreme Court cases for the upcoming term after this short break. Don't go anywhere. We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides.